dear friends, good morning, uh, good afternoon from wherever you're joining us from. Uh, welcome to our webinar uh, today. We are de delighted uh, to be hosting you uh, to this webinar, a uh, second of a series of biodiversity knowledge hub convenings. Uh, the first one was on bushmeat and its effects uh, to animal and populations, to animal populations and human health. The Biodiversity Knowledge Hub convenings are run by Internews Earth Journalism Network uh, with funding from USI8 and the Department of Interior. Internews is an international media support nonprofit, but we believe everyone deserves trustworthy news and information to make informed decisions about their lives. Earth Journalism Network is a program of Internews uh, with membership in over 100 countries. Uh, the AJN East African program seeks to improve uh, the quality and the quantity of the coverage of wildlife and conservation issues in Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya, and Rwanda uh, through media trainings, webinars like this one, and offering of story grants. You can learn more uh, on our website, Earth Journalism Network, uh, earthjournalism.net. And if not already uh, registered to become a member, where you start to benefit from opportunities, including trainings, travel facilita facilitation to international conventions, and of course, uh, getting story grants uh, to do stories that you otherwise be not able to do. As you join this webinar, and we're glad that you're able to join us this morning and uh, this afternoon, wherever you're joining us from, uh, please note uh, that you are on mute and off video uh, so that we, are, we can avoid disruptions. But you are, you'll be able to ask questions uh, through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Please do not ask your question through the chat feature. Use the Q&A. And please be sure to address your question to the specific speaker. You can use the chat icon to write your name and where you're joining us from and where you work. So again, thank you so much uh, for joining us this afternoon at uh, this um, morning, where we are joined by great speakers uh, to discuss about illegal wildlife trade, a crime that not only decimates our rich natural heritage, uh, but denies countless communities' livelihoods while disinheriting our children. The speakers will take us through how man's best friend, the dog, helps in deterring criminals as well as detecting the contraband in East Africa's seas and airports. Uh, uh, before I invite our first speaker, uh, I will again, you know, uh, ask you uh, to ask you a question on the chat. Sorry, uh, on the Q&A, uh, but you can tell us who you are and where you're joining us from uh, on the chat. Uh, we'll, we are recording, I can really notice that we are recording uh, this webinar and we will upload uh, the recording uh, on our website at journalism.net as well as uh, on our EJ, on our EJN YouTube channel. Uh, after the uh, webinar, I will also have uh, uh, a resource email, what you call a resource email. I will send you the email of uh, the names and the bios and the presentations from the speakers uh, today, of course, as well as uh, the recording. Uh, that's by today uh, evening or tomorrow. Uh, so that if you're a journalist, uh, you can use that uh, those materials are uh, to be able to to do your stories and if you are a conservationist uh, i'm very sure that uh, the information on this webinar uh, will be useful to you i will also uh, have a survey that will kind of ask you uh, to feel and you know give us your thought, your feedback about this webinar so that we are better able uh, to plan for future ones i uh, saw so my colleague uh, who is uh, of video, uh, Rose Odengo, uh, and Edward, I uh, will share with, with you on the chat uh, the Microsoft form uh, to kindly feel uh, towards the, the tail end of this uh, conversation and this narrative. Uh, we are grateful uh, to be joined by our two speakers, Dr. Philip uh, Muruthi and Mr. Mark Kenyon. Our first speaker uh, will be Dr. Philip Muruthi, who is the Vice President, Species Conservation and science at the Africa Wildlife Foundation. He has gained, where he has gained immense experience and repute. Mr. Muru, Dr. Muruthi, sorry, has a keen interest 
in the protection of endangered species, including rhinos, elephants, uh, large carnivores, and rich apes. He approaches natural resource management broadly, ensuring that species, communities, and systems are part of the integrated conservation, including community participation and livelihood improvement. Uh, Dr. Murudi has already shared uh, his presentation, and of course, he'll be telling us about how, about one of the solutions uh, to the runaway illegal wildlife crime. And I hope uh, Dr. Murudi, you first take us through, uh, you know, you know, like a roundup uh, of the status of wildlife conservation in Kenya and the region. Thank you so much, and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. My name is Philip Murothy, and I'm the Vice President for Species Conservation and uh, Science at the African Wildlife Foundation. Let me just uh, introduce our organization, which is the African Wildlife Foundation, and it's uh, an NGO that works with the governments of Africa. We have a mission to ensure that wildlife and wildlands thrive in a modern Africa. And the, let me first check that people are seeing my presentation. Kundu, are you, am I fine with the presentation? Yes, yes, we can, we can. Very well. Okay, good. Yeah. yes, good. So I want just to emphasize the, the, the fact that we believe wildlife has a key role in the sustainable development of Africa. So that uh, we, as even Africa, modernizes with all the aspirations of uh, having you know food on the table having infrastructure good medicine you know improved health wildlife and natural resources and then and the natural world has a key role in that we don't see that separation at the african wildlife foundation and hence the importance of safeguarding nature we have three goals in our in our in our organization which i believe most of you will share with us that africans are central uh, the African voice, the African participation is central to, to achieving that, uh, that, that, that goal of ensuring that wildlife and wildlands thrive in modern Africa. We can get support from outside, but this is our key role of our governments and us as citizens of Africa. Our second goal is to conserve and protect and restore ecosystems and the services they provide. Most of us see habitats and you know we think about forests, but, of, uh, but rarely do we think about the services that they provide. It's inseparable, our own existence is inseparable from nature. And thirdly, which is very pertinent to the talk today, is conserving Africa's wildlife in their natural habitats or in situ. Trafficking, which we shall, and poaching, which we shall concentrate on today, is not just about Africa. Actually, I like this map. It shows you that it puts in context Africa uh, in terms of size. You see how many countries can fit in. Well, there are many countries too, and the global, everybody in the globe is really looking at Africa's resources, either positively or sometimes negatively, as in poaching and trafficking. So it's not just a, an, an Africa issue, it's a global issue that we are dealing with. Africa uh, and our region here in East Africa is quite well connected. You can actually fly from a uh, you can fly contraband or, you know, or anything from West Africa to the consumer countries in the East, like China or Cambodia or Vietnam in a single day. And this is just a map that I borrowed from one of the traffic uh, publications that shows hubs for trafficking. Um, our region, East Africa, the, especially the countries of Kenya, Uganda and Tanzania, are known historically for not only being range states, but also transient uh, for, for contraband, such as ivory, rhino horn, lion bone, and, and pangolins. Uh, Dar es Salaam, Nairobi, Entebbe, Addis Ababa are, you know, they are, they are quite well connected. And they, at one point, uh, the three African countries, East, uh, Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania, were actually among us the top eight countries of concern. This, the so-called uh, Gang of Eight in, uh, in CITES, the Convention on uh, Trade in Endangered Species, the International Trade in Endangered Species. Now, where, you, where do you find uh, most of the trafficking? Of course, trafficking is, uh, 
and poaching are illegal. I just want to make that clear up front. And uh, as you will see later, wildlife and natural resources in trees and uh, you know, animals face a lot of threats. Now, if you look at the, this map, you see the, the, ranges, the range countries for both elephant uh, forest and uh, savanna elephants. And the, the stars show you the, the transit hubs, uh, some in our region, but also interesting, interestingly, some are in countries that have very few elephants, for example, Nigeria, uh, you know, Benin. These are countries, so there is a lot of movement inside, within the range states, but also away from the range states. So it's a, as we do, as we talk about uh, stopping trafficking and poaching, uh, poaching feeds the trafficking, and you know, and all of them are geared towards uh, the illegal wildlife trade. Uh, there is a legal wildlife trade, uh, which we'll not uh, talk about here, but that's legal um, in, in, in several countries. But what we are talking about here is one that threatens the wildlife if not well managed. So why does it matter? It matters because we know that wildlife, and here I'll use wildlife generally for you know, plants and, and, uh, and, and, and animals, the, the, they are, they are very important in terms of sustaining life, our life, the ecological role that wildlife plays. So for example, some of you might know that elephants are very important in maintaining healthy habitats uh, as seed dispersers. Many birds disperse uh, seeds. There are many insects that uh, are pollinators for both food, but also for plants that from which we require uh, goods such as, uh, you know, you are, your hardwood for your team, for, for the timber for your chair. Um, clean air, climate change, mitigating against floods, uh, e e economic and livelihoods. And uh, generally, the problem that we are talking about uh, uh, poses a lot of insecurity to everything that I have mentioned. But importantly, it uh, eventually leads to the extinction of species, if not well managed. Currently, so we often start with common species, such as, you know, all species were common at one point. Um, so elephants were many. There were 1.2 million elephants at the at 1970s, beginning of, you know, uh, mid 70s. Right now, there are about 415,000. That's about just a quarter or, or a third of, of, of that remains. And uh, recently, the elephant, actually my chart here should be corrected because the elephant now is not vulnerable under the IUCN classification of, of endangerment, but uh, both species of the savanna and the forest elephant are endangered. You move them from common to vulnerable to endangered, you push them more by poaching the northern white rhino, and of which we are only left with two, I think now, or Tarupejeta, two individuals people. Uh, that's very, very critical. And eventually you, 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 you go into extinction. During my time at, in conservation, I have seen species go extinct. And uh, if you are there in 2012, you will have known that the rhino, the rhino, the northern rhino that occurred in Chad and Cameroon went extinct, was officially declared extinct. Now, with, all, with that, it means that the services I've been talking about the potential to improve livelihoods, that resource is gone, your heritage is gone. Uh, and that we, as Africa, we really need to be, be very, very aware of that. Um, let me just give an example of why this is important. If you live in Nairobi, you will know that a lot of the water, over three quarters of your water comes from Abadeas and the, you know, the Abadea forest and national parks. And that, that Abadea forest is kept healthy by the relationship between these animals as dispersers. Uh, of seeds and they keep it healthy. Without them, some of the plants will not be there and therefore you will not get your water. That's just one example. This chart shows you where we are with some of the species. Uh, again, I just said uh, the elephants are 415,000 uh, and there, there's a decline. The only species there that shows an increase is really the mountain gorilla. But again, look, they are just about a thousand right now, this, uh, if we update this chart. A thousand is very vulnerable. Uh, on this chart, just follow, this is what is called the, the proportion of illegally uh, killed elephants. It's a measure of the total number of 
elephants that have died, of those, how many have been killed illegally? Of course, elephants die naturally too, or from problem animal control. The red line that is straight, the mid line here at 0 0.5 shows you is the, is the threshold below, above which you, should, you get worried that your population is then starting to decline. And you will see that if you follow the dark red one, you will see that in 2011 in East Africa, our pike level was uh, at 0 0.6, which means our population was, was, was declining. Right now we are doing relatively well. The pike level is at about 0 0.2, but what you eventually want this to be is at 0. Point, uh, is, at point, is at zero. So we are doing well, but we are not out of the woods. Now, how I just showed here a list of uh, other problems that uh, faces nature conservation, uh, habitat fragmentation, human wildlife conflict, poverty levels, incompatible agriculture, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure, insecurity. But today I'm going to concentrate on poaching and illegal wildlife trade. But just to say that wildlife and natural resources are facing all this and uh, what we need to do is have a, an integrated uh, approach, but uh, make, uh, there is a synergistic uh, uh, impact on, on natural resources. So where you have uh, habitat loss, you may also have poaching, which then means that the resource you are trying to conserve is facing uh, uh, increased uh, uh, danger. Um, we do, we, we respond by strengthening uh, conservation organizations, investing in the capacity of local people, enlisting uh, community uh, support, looking at the laws, uh, stiffer, stiffer penalties, but also most importantly, education, regulating trade in endangered species, lobbying, and enhancing the African voice, uh, really making sure that Africans are participating from the, from the local level all the way to our leaders. You can see conservation and protection of species in three, three areas, stopping the killing, working on the ground, enhancing coexistence, uh, anti-poaching, that falls in there. Stopping the trafficking, uh, increasing detection and prosecutorial uh, training, uh, making sure that uh, law enforcers are, 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 are working well and there is collaboration across, across uh, agencies and, and regions. And then stopping the demand. When the demand stops, of course the killing will stop. So we have we had a campaign, for example, in the in the in the, in the 90s, and then in the early 2000s, where that led eventually to China uh, declaring a, a stoppage of of uh, ivory trade in a, in, a, in a domestically, and then giving voice to to Africans so that they can be uh, not only recipients but uh, active participants and beneficiaries. We work with the uh, at African Wildlife Foundation. We work with the authorities which means that the, the program I'm going to be telling you about is owned by the authorities. We are currently in uh, these countries, there are seven. We have uh, detection dogs. Uh, we have uh, tracker dogs in, uh, in some of these countries. The program that we do is not owned by AWF or African Wildlife Foundation, it's owned by these authorities. Tanzania Wildlife Authority, ANAC in Mozambique, uh, Uganda Wildlife Authority, Kenya Wildlife Service, and the uh, Department of Wildlife and, uh, and you know and parks in in in, in, in uh, Botswana, uh, Minfo in uh, Cameroon, and Yuka in uh, in Ethiopia. And we are expanding. So there are two types uh, or three types of dogs. I'm only going to talk about two. One is the detection dog that smells, sniffs. Oh well, all dogs can sniff, but uh, this is uh, the dog that will detect in your bag if you are carrying any contraband. And then the tracker dog is like most of you are familiar with the police dog that tracks the scent of your footprints. Uh, let's say when you have left a building and it will track your, your, your shoes, the smell from your shoes and eventually get you. We don't use uh, attacker dogs or assault dogs because of uh, the relationships you want to maintain with the, with, the, with the communities and people you work with. Why do you use dogs? Well, when we were surveying how to deal with the, the problem, and one of the problems here is that contraband is usually, we, we know that there is poaching and we know this a bit sometimes late when in Asian countries, there is a, you know, somebody has been arrested or huge holes of ivory or, uh, or rhino horn have been found. And so detection is a problem other than, you know, uh, enforcement. So 
we want to increase detection and the tool that we have selected, one of the tools we have selected, of course, you have seen the x-rays at the, uh, you know, at the airport. One of the tools that we have selected is the dog. The dog has a highly developed olfaction, more than 100,000 times as acute as the human nose. It's incorruptible. Uh, it just smells and it goes for it. It doesn't lie. And then it is a deterrent. That's very important. I'll come back to that. They are highly efficient. So commas cannot be delayed. They can check a, a whole airplane, you know, a Boeing 747 in just a few minutes, and there is no delay. And then it can detect many things. Just some, some examples, some images. So this is at the training school we have in Usa River in, in Arusha. Uh, this lady is from uh, Botswana with a dog here being trained. This is, they are trained on real life situations, what they will face when they go to the field. The pairing is very important of the handler and the dog. The detection, we are training them on these scents, ivory, pangolin scales, rhino horn, and other products. Where do you check? These are, here are some in vehicles, shipping containers, luggage, you know, air cargo, Sometimes it's houses, you know, in people's houses, if we have intelligence, so we combine this with intelligence. Uh, as I said, it doesn't take very long, just a few minutes. It's about smell. And then if the dog, the dog is trained to give some cues to the handler. And if the, um, somebody is, uh, if, if there is a smell, positive smell, the dog will sit and then you, you know, the rest will follow uh, of the evidence management of the, the crime scene and or evidence management. Here is at the airport in Nairobi. They have really been perfect in, in, in deterring, but also finding real contraband. Um, there are key elements. I will not go over all these key elements, but my message on this slide is it's, a, it's not an easy program. You have to select the dogs, train them, select handlers. We select handlers, usually working with the authorities. Um, and uh, these, the handlers are usually rangers. We select from the pool of rangers. The authority is the, our contact within government. So Kenya Wildlife Service would be the contact, Uganda Wildlife Authority within government. We have a technical advisor that we attach to the, we second to the authorities. They give us the training aids, which are like the rhino horn. Uh, we build kennels, transport, provide food, vet services, very, very specialized uh, program. We also develop tools, such as uh, this manual for best practices that we developed. And uh, we also teach these handlers how to present uh, evidence uh, in the court. Because eventually you want to arrest, but not just arrest. You want people to face the law and uh, if they are guilty, but also you want to give them an education. The training school at uh, Usa River in Tanzania, we have trained from all those countries. See here the old vehicles, these are mimicking the real situation. You want to train the dogs in the real situation they will find on the, on the road. Uh, the, the rapport between handler and dog is paramount. And, you know, I can speak long about this, but just these photos, I hope, depict to you this. Um, some of the kennels we have done in Kenya, in, uh, in, in Uganda, we have kennels in Entebbe and then in Northern Uganda at Murchison, in Mozambique at the airport. These are all programs that are actually demanded by the authorities. In Mozambique, they have literally stopped the, 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 the trafficking of, uh, of, uh, of rhino horn particularly that used to be notorious. Uh, mobile kennels that we use, the dog vans are customized. They are just as good as the van you use. And people ask why buy a new car and an air conditioned car for a dog? Well, if you want to save wildlife, the dog needs to be comfortable. Just a few examples there. And then importantly, the dogs must enjoy these five freedoms all the time. And this is one of the things we put in our memorandum of understanding with the authorities. Freedom from hunger and thirst, freedom from discomfort, from pain, injury, and disease, freedom to express normal behavior, and freedom from, from fear and distress. When you attain these five freedoms, you know your dogs are working well. What do we find? What have the teams, the authorities and our teams have been finding? Here is an example everything, they work it out, they grind it, they will put a pepper, they will conceal it, uh, but the dogs will find it. Remember, they are working by scent only. They don't have to see. The, ag the small agitation that happens in your bag as you're moving is enough to at least to, to produce the scent and the dog will find it. But people are clever. Look at the photo here where the casa is. You'll see somebody had put contraband in a piece of wood and yet the dog found it. 
Uh, here is a summary of the fines in uh, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. You will see the trend here. So for example, if you follow the red line, the very high one, you will see that in 2016, when we started, we started and went and were making fines up to, you know, like 2018, 80 fines. These are a mixture of large and small. And then they go down because the dog, people know, people are being taken to court. And so what we have done is combine this with the intelligence from police and from the wildlife authorities and make sure that uh, the, dog, the dog unit is part of the big uh, security uh, program. And then move these dogs, start other units and uh, the, make them mobile so that we are not just sitting in one place. Because as you can see in, from the Uganda case, you have an increase and then down. This is the same case we experienced in Kenya. Uh, where we started with the mini, and right now we are getting almost zero at, at Jomo Kenyatta. We have started a station in Naivasha with the Kenya Allies Service, another one in, in, in Mombasa. So that's, that's what we are doing. And uh, in 2022, here are some results. Uh, we are still finding the poacher has not stopped. We are still finding contraband, and about 78 people, persons were arrested in total from those countries that I have shown you. We have a uh, tracker dog units for anti-poaching in uh, Tanzania and Kenya, and uh, also now in Uganda. All this being part of the larger picture. It's working, it's reducing poaching and trafficking, and the uh, wildlife populations are getting back to where they were. It's, uh, it's very linked to government, and here is the late, uh, His Excellency Dr. Magufuli, President of the Republic of Tanzania, uh, during one of the finds, viewing one of the finds in Dar es Salaam. Interestingly, I say dogs are incorruptible. Interestingly, one of these, uh, we have had a case in one of the countries where somebody decided they were not going to see the ivory through the x-ray, but in the back on the conveyor belt, the dogs found it and uh, well, action was taken. Very, very interesting. We, our aim is to arrest, to deter, but also to educate. Eventually we would like to have a case where People are not trafficking. People recognize that wildlife is good in the natural environment and it's part of their development and well-being, and that they are not part of the, the syndicates that, uh, but we are not lost to the fact that the syndicates are strong, they pay big money, uh, but uh, we want people to own wildlife, we want people to, for this program, not basically to grow very big. We want that people are working for their wildlife and that uh, they are educated and uh, they, they know the value of wildlife so that enforcement does not take so much and uh, that eventually people can benefit from wildlife. These are the countries where we are working and, the, and, the, and the, the, the programs where they are. And we would like to expand this uh, as we have seen it is scalable and uh, it is something that uh, the authorities are taking up as part of their, pro their, 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 their programs. And uh, it's really it's really working well, and to help recover the wildlife, creating opportunities for our people and our countries to benefit from the wildlife. Finally, I would like to end by saying that it is very very important for us as conservationists and uh, also journalists and uh, citizens of Africa, citizens of our countries, to take this as our responsibility, but also for people like us and the wildlife authorities that are tasked with this role, for, to ask us. You know, how do you measure success? Are you tracking? Is it, is it working? I have just told you that it is working and populations are recovering. Uh, I can attest that, uh, you know, in Kenya, for example, the rates of uh, poaching have gone down. Uh, last year, we didn't lose any rhino to poaching in, 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 thanks to Kenya Allies Service uh, because of these dogs and other activities that are being undertaken. We will be uh, expanding this program. We are building a new kennel uh, dog facility in, at Bole Airport and uh, just starting uh, very intensive searches in Cameroon, and we are considering other countries as we go forward. Thank you very much. I hope that I haven't exceeded my time by, by much. No, you are within time, uh, Dr. Murudi. Thank you so much uh, for your very informative uh, presentation. I, I like your finishing because it goes back uh, to the beginning where you said all species were common at one point. Uh, in time, and now you've caught all of us into action, uh, which indeed is a good thing because today uh, we have over 70 uh, people listening in now, 
uh, taken from the further state in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and Uganda, as well as our partners uh, in conservation and uh, environment world, uh, again, from uh, these countries. And uh, we hope each and every one, one of us uh, will learn uh, something today and we work you know, together uh, to save uh, our iconic uh, species and habitats. So there are a couple of questions uh, for you, Dr. Murudi, uh, but can you allow me to bring in Mr. Kenya, and then we'll you know, take all the questions uh, together. Again, colleagues, thank you so much uh, for joining us this afternoon, uh, this morning. I know some of us are in other you know, time zones. And uh, as we said, if you came in late, uh, we ask that you kindly, if you have a question, uh, direct, directly uh, direct that to the specific speaker uh, on the Q&A icon. Uh, there is a chat and a Q&A uh, below your screen. Uh, kindly for the chat, you can let us know who you are and where you're joining us from, but uh, take your question to the Q&A. Uh, kindly note, we're recording this and we'll be sharing on our website later, uh, as well as the resources, uh, including uh, the two presentations. Uh, Dr. Murudi has been you know, referring to the authorities and uh, uh, we've been able to, to, to get uh, KWS uh, to join us uh, today, and uh, I know they work closely together. Uh, so some slides uh, might uh, probably sound the same, uh, but uh, they're speaking from different uh, experiences and from different uh, spaces. Uh, al allow me to introduce uh, Mr. Mark Kenya, who is a canine expert, who tells me that he grew and lives around dogs. So it's only natural he made his hobby to work and great work of saving our iconic natural habitats. Mr. Kenya joined KWS over 10 years ago, and at one time, he headed the canine unit where he managed and coordinated border points, canine teams, and field teams to tackle trafficking of wildlife and wildlife products. Currently, he's stationed in Mombasa as the head of Marine and Community Programs Kenya Wildlife Service. But of course, today he'll be talking about his experience uh, with the man's best friend, uh, the one we've been told is awesomely talented uh, with, sense, uh, with uh, a sense uh, of smell. Uh, with this, again, before Mr. Kenua, uh, share you, as you start sharing your presentation, I would like to especially thank uh, the KWS Acting Director General, Dr. Eras Erastas Kanga, for appointing you, Mr. Kenya, to speak to our audience today. We are hoping uh, to partner in many more educational events as this one, as well as uh, for the reporters that we support, uh, if you could give us an audience uh, to ask you questions about conservation uh, in the great nation of Kenya. Uh, we've also been able uh, to work uh, with authorities in Tanzania, Tanapa, as well as Uganda, uh, Wildlife uh, Authority uh, in Uganda, uh, and also in Rwanda. And uh, we, we always appreciate when we share of that information that we can use uh, with our stories so that we can educate uh, our audiences as Dr. Murudi has called us to action to, 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 to do more and more. Uh, so Mr. Kenya, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Kiundu. Uh, thank you, Dr. Murudi. And uh, to the attendants, of this webinar. Uh, thank you for participating in it as we uh, move forward to teach, our, to teach each other uh, about uh, canines, their work. You know, sometimes we call them dogs outside, but uh, they can be very helpful and a force multiplier in uh, fighting illegal wildlife trafficking and poaching. So I just want to confirm whether you can see my presentation. Can you? Yes, I can. Uh, we can. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So Kenya Wildlife Service is a state corporation that uh, is under the Ministry of Tourism and Wildlife. And it's established, it was established under the Act of Parliament, uh, CAP 376 of 1989. So 
uh, it was then repealed and replaced by the recently uh, edited and reviewed Cons Wildlife Conservation Management Act of 2013, which uh, introduced some punitive laws, especially for wildlife traffickers. So that was a win for us. Um, so where does Kenya Wildlife Service work? All over the country. Um, I think uh, most of us may not uh, know the numbers, but the area under protected area, uh, protected area system, and this is, includes conservancies, marine parks, terrestrial, terrestrial national parks, and marine reserves and national sanctuaries is about 19% of the country's landmass. So Kenya Wildlife Service is spread all over the country. And for management efficiency, we have we are divided into eight conservation, conservation areas, uh, namely Northern, Eastern, the Savos, the coast where I am currently, mountain area, and uh, you know, Western Central Rift and Southern. So Kenya Wildlife Service saw so it fit to establish a canine unit and it falls under the Directorate of uh, Security. We have directorates at the headquarters, uh, but specifically under the Wildlife Protection Department. Now it was formed to combat poaching. And just like uh, Dr. Philip Morudi mentioned, um, he, he mentioned to stop the killing. So this is where we have our units placed, uh, right where we have uh, national sanctuaries. And for uh, it was also formed to combat illegal wildlife trafficking and wildlife products. So in this case, we normally use detection, uh, detection dogs, or some people call them sniffer dogs. And uh, it was established in the year 2000 with the help of the British Army. And uh, they gave us three dogs. Initially, we started quite uh, thin, three dogs, and they also built 17 kennels in uh, Naivasha. So where are we placed? Uh, so the unit is spread roughly all around the country, but I would like to mention uh, that we are also mobile. So we have tracking canine teams in Meru, Meru is right around uh, here, if you can see the Casa. Uh, Solio Ranch, which is cl very close to Mount Kenya. Lake Nakuru National Park, around Central Rift, around here. Uh, the Savos, Savo East and West, where we also have the Ngulia Rhino Sanctuary. So we have another tracking team here. And uh, this covers also Savo East. So we have then detection teams who are present uh, at Jomo Kenyatta International Airport and Mombasa International Airport. But we also have them at the port of Mombasa, which is uh, just nearby the Mombasa city, close to the Mombasa city. And uh, also, we also do borders, border, border checks and uh, also do uh, roadblocks. Of course, this we coordinate together with our uh, the Kenya National, uh, the National Police Service. Uh, in addition, we have the training unit based in Naivasha. So the canine training unit is based in Naivasha. So what kind of dogs do we use? We have the bi-breed, the Belgian Malinois. Uh, this is a very agile dog much smaller than the German Shepherd, which you see on the right, uh, but very extremely agile. And it has very few, it has fewer health issues than uh, the German Shepherd. We have the Springer Spaniel, which is quite uh, small in size, but very agile as well. So we can put it on the conveyor belt of airports, uh, which you'll see later in a small clip that I have here. We also have the Bloodhound, which is excellent, a very good tracking dog. It has a, a very good nose and the German Shepherds. This is a picture of the canine uh, unit training base. And at some point we had, uh, we actually have some uh, tracking and uh, patrol dogs. 
Uh, if you can remember from Dr. Murudi's presentation, he mentioned about uh, patrol dogs. So we, we have quite a number of patrol dogs, but we also have uh, tracking and uh, detection dogs. So this is how it's done. We know, normally use a long leash, and uh, uh, Dr. Morudi mentioned that we normally recruit from the, ranger, uh, the rangers team. So this is one of our rangers. Uh, this was a short exercise uh, in Solio, where we have a rhino sanctuary. And uh, this is a bloodhound um, called Philemon. So we normally use a long tracking rope and uh, give the dog some space so that it can guide us. So normally it's not captured in this uh, photo, but normally we have uh, armed units trailing us in, uh, in actual situations of tracking. That's another photo. Uh, so we, we normally we collaborate with partners and some of our partners are without a doubt African Wildlife Foundation, which uh, we very closely work with at the moment, I think uh, on, an, on a daily basis. Uh, African Wildlife, Afri uh, sorry, Animal Welfare Institute, who also donated some tracking dogs and protection dogs. So on my right, you can see, this is an exercise of bite work. So normally what these uh, tracking dogs uh, would do is track, and then they would also apprehend by biting. So this is one of the dogs that we use. Uh, normally we also have aerial reinforcement. And uh, thanks to these tracking dogs, that's why we had uh, zero rhino poaching in 2020. And uh, rightly so, as uh, Dr. Philip Morodi mentioned, uh, our numbers substantially decreased in rhino poaching. So this is a photo of our sniffer teams or detection teams. And uh, this is uh, JKIA uh, right at the baggage area. Yeah, so we normally, uh, when the flights come in, we normally take our dogs to sniff out the, the entire luggage in, uh, fr from the planes as they come. Now, these are some of the finds. Now you can see photos of uh, worked ivory. Some will try and um, carve the ivory so that uh, just to try and uh, disguise it. But just as uh, Dr. Murudi mentioned, the dogs will find it. Another photo, so you can see this is a, a, a cigarette uh, pipe, necklaces. So what we normally check for is uh, the change in behavior. So what, 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 what the canine does, what the, the handler does is brings the dog to do detection, but then the canine, the, the, the handler normally is uh, very keen on change of behavior. Uh, or the cues. So the dog, when you see a dog react, then you can uh, you you can zoom in or zero in on a on a specific luggage nearest the point of source of the order. Uh, so just like they say, numbers don't lie. So these are the numbers since 2014 to 2022. The incidences of arrests uh, in 2020 in 2014 were 22 of them. But the number of traffickers that were arrested and prosecuted were 35 of them. So you can have one incident, but then three Chinese, three, three, three people traveling together, for example. And uh, what, what, what the, 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 the three of them will be attempting to traffic wildlife across the border. So that's why you see the numbers are different. Eh? So the highest bust that we had, and uh, that was also indicated in Dr. Murudi's uh, graph was in 2016. So you can see 34 incidences and then 41 people prosecuted. Now the total is 102, the total to date is 102 uh, incidences and about 114 people prosecuted. And uh, they were given punitive laws, some of them up to fines of 1 million. 
and uh, you know uh, some some of the things that some of the fines that they had the total was uh, two tons of raw ivory, worked ivory necklaces, and even pangolin scales. This is a photo which I'll uh, quickly rush through because uh, Dr. Murudi, I think, presented the same. Now, these are pangolin scales. But also, I'd like to point out that we find, uh, you know, these are live tortoises. Yeah. So they were trying to disguise live tortoises, but our dogs found them. That's uh, a spring a spaniel. So in 2016, we started seeing a change in trend. And uh, we realized that people were trafficking pangolins, a lot of pangolins. I think as it is right now, pangolins are the most uh, trafficked animals in the world. So we had to teach our dogs that order and they found uh, quite a sub substantial amount of pangolin skills. Now this incident, uh, that was on 18th March, 2016, these uh, boxes had been declared as feathers, but uh, when we put our dogs to task and our canine teams, they indicated, and we opened and found 500 kilograms of pangolin scales. So we also have a number of challenges uh, because we're quite uh, thin and the country is vast. Uh, we, 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 we would like to expand our infrastructure and uh, transport, uh, transporting these canine teams to, to targeted areas. So we also would like to work at night. So sometimes we're limited and we can't work uh, throughout the night, uh, especially for our, uh, our tracking teams in national parks and national sanctuaries. We also have a por porous border with uh, many entry points, uh, especially along the coastline. And the coastline is quite vast, over 530 kilometers. Uh, we also have issues with sesefly. And uh, if there's any, anybody in attendance that is hearing this, we'd love for you to come and give a long-term solution, of course, guided by the veterinarians on how we can, combine, we can combat uh, trypanosomiasis, which is spread by sesa flies. It is, uh, I think we've lost about four dogs, uh, both in Savos and Meru, and that's because we have many, many sesa flies in the sanctuaries. We also have a large port, uh, and I think the, 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 the number of uh, containers that are processed per day is in the thousands. Uh, we, we collaborate, quite well with our partners. AWF has been very instrumental in setting us up uh, as a unit. African Wildlife, uh, Animal Wildlife uh, Institute, the UNODC has done quite a number of trainings, but also the Kenya National Police uh, Service. The dog unit to be specific helps, helped us uh, set up and uh, train some dogs, some handlers and dogs as well. And uh, one of the trainings that we recently had was a trainer, trainer of trainers uh, training uh, from the United States Customs and Border Patrol K-19. But not only that, we also collaborate with our multi-agency team, uh, Joint Port Control Unit. And uh, since the containers are quite a number that comes through Mombasa Port, we, what we do is that uh, we reach out to this team and they profile for us so we can go and target a specific container that they have flagged. Uh, African Wildlife Foundation has uh, helped us develop and deploy detection teams, um, donated some detection dogs, uh, transport as well, attached a tactical supervisor, just as uh, Dr. Morosby mentioned, and also helped, set, uh, uh, helped develop standard operating procedures to implement the canine strategy. 
Now, this is a photo of uh, the port, and you can see, I don't know whether you can even count from uh, the image how many containers. It is quite uh, packed with containers. So there's a technology that is still in the process, and we have tested it. We tested it, I think, uh, we tested it in 2018. Uh, the name of the technology is RASCO, Remote Air Sampling for Canine All Function. So what we'll do, we'll bridge the door, the rubbers, the containers have rubbers right at the doors. So we'll bridge it and put a small uh, straw-like pipe, flexible pipe. Now this air is then vacuum cleaned and uh, put in a filter. Of course, this generator is backup. So this is our team based at the port. Uh, we'll put the air in a filter and then we have our detection dogs in a, in a nice uh, air conditioned room because the coast can be quite hot. And what the dog will do, will go through these small filters and what it hits, it indicates. Uh, this is, uh, sorry, let me just explain. So when a dog finds an order that it's familiar to. In this case, we're talking about uh, wildlife, uh, uh, rhino horn, for example, or ivory or pangolin scales, it normally sits. So this is uh, a small trail that we are doing uh, with the filters. Now, this system we believe can help us uh, because it takes only 20 minutes to vacuum clean the air for a 20 foot container and uh, about 30 minutes for 40 foot container. So we can do many containers. We can vacuum clean many containers. And then when the dog indicates, now we can go ahead, call the, the multi-agency team and open the container. Uh, this is a small nice. Now, uh, the purpose of this slide is just to show you the efficiency of a dog. So I don't know whether any of you is counting, but uh, just take note of how many seconds it does. It takes for a, a nice properly trained dog to sniff. I believe that's about two seconds per bag or three seconds uh, at most. Uh, so I'd like to thank you all for participating and uh, we're open to questions. Handing over to you, Mr. Kiyundu. Yes, uh, that's great, uh, Mr. Kenya. Thank you so much. I've, you know, personally, you know, uh, learned, learned uh, you know, a lot uh, about dogs. Uh, you, you know, uh, I see the work we do as a journalist, I'm personally a trained journalist, uh, as well as some of the uh, colleagues joining us today, uh, we we have an expression that if you're a good journalist and you you know you are able to to get news and to do many stories in the media, we say you have a nose uh, for the news, and uh, you spoke about one of the dogs having you know a very good nose. Uh, so I think we are in familiar territory, and they're doing great work, and that was a. Uh, you know, a very good uh, presentation. Uh, something else I've learned. Also, uh, maybe if, if you can uh, ask you a, a quick question is that uh, the dog must of course been have trained into a particular scent uh, for it to detect. Uh, so perhaps uh, this to allude to the fact that uh, maybe uh, there were a lot of, uh, you know, poaching of other animals uh, and passing by our borders uh, like the, the pangolin. Uh, before we train the dogs uh, on that. Mr. Kenyon, Dr. Murudi. Can you go again, uh, please, uh, Can We correctly uh, assume that uh, before we train the dog on a particular animal, uh, like for instance, Mr. Kenyon has said that uh, uh, before we knew a uh, pangolin has become uh, a victim, uh, can we correctly assume then uh, it can pass undetected uh, before we train the dogs uh, on these on these particular scents? It could, 
I'll answer then Kenya can uh, use more law enforcement than I am. But uh, so the, the, the dog is trained on this particular sense, like uh, ivory. So to you, ivory doesn't smell. Uh, clean ivory doesn't have any smell, but the dog will detect that. Now, if you have not trained a, a dog, say, on live tortoises, but the tortoises are coming through the airport, the dog will actually detect something living, something is something, the, the scent of an animal, even though it is not trained. We, they have caught at Jomo Kenyatta Airport, uh, tortoises, other things that they have not been trained on. I think because there is that scent that is coming out and the dog just gets agitated by the scent and uh, shows the behavior for some for something that is unusual passing through. Yeah, so there is that possibility that they will not get something that uh, they have not been trained in, but he, they have gotten things that they were never really trained on. So we keep on adding scents to the, to the, to the training. I'm told by the experts that uh, you can add up to 30 uh, cents. Per dog. Per dog. Yes. That's amazing. Thank you for the answer. Uh, well, you have something to add, Mr. Kenya? Uh, uh, yes, uh, thank you for your answer, Dr. Murudi, and uh, rightly so, that's, uh, that's, that's what normally happens. Uh, a dog will detect, uh, for instance, uh, in the case of tortoise, uh, live movement. Uh, and what happens is that when you have traffickers, uh, their body language, their smell is not normal. So the dog will pick up on the carbon that the body produces, oxytoxin and chemicals. So the dog will pick up on that and zero in on, the, on that uh, trafficker. Uh, so these tortoises were disguised in, in uh, inside clothing of uh, some uh, Vietnamese. And uh, fortunately, we found them. Thank you so much uh, for both of your answers. I'm trying to, Dr. Um, Ruthie, thank you so much. Uh, I think we spoke about this yesterday when we were doing our dry run. Uh, if you folks, if you look at the Q&A, uh, you'll see that uh, our speakers are able to answer to some of the questions live, and this saves time. Uh, so if you go to the open questions, uh, you'll find that uh, there are 11 questions, and then you'll find seven answered. I hope that's what we see. Uh, so some of your questions have been answered live uh, by Dr. Murudi. Uh, so I'll hope to pass on those, and uh, not unless I find it very important. Uh, and then we can ask the questions that have, been, have not been answered live. Uh, like for my friend, uh, Daniel Wagema, who works in the Kenyan News Agency. Uh, I think he works from the South region. He asked me, conservancy play a very critical role in species conservation, especially at a time when parks are experiencing severe droughts. Given that most animals were growth there to escape drought, I have two conservancies in mind. Uh, I hope you can have less on that. Uh, you can send that to Agema. And if you're still with us, uh, I hope we can take that. Uh, I am Gabriel Igumbu from Western Kenya. Hope I get audio of this webinar to help me make a radio program. Definitely get a recording. Uh, Gabriel. And uh, to Mr. Kenya, this is from Just Chibi, uh, works with uh, International Press Service. Uh, to Mr. Kenya, wildlife population remains under threat. What challenges does the Canine Conservation Unit face in line of duty? I guess you you looked into those. Uh, can we first take uh, the one from Daniel Wagema about conservancies? Yes, <laughs> let me attempt to that one and then. Uh... <laughs> My friend Kenya can come in. The important thing about the wildlife conservation is to see that the various units have to work together. So in the Savo area that where he's asking about, uh, the park itself, the two parks or three parks, Chulu, Savo, East Savo West National Parks have to work. Uh, so it, if it is poaching, they have to have good anti-poaching. Uh, but also the wildlife disperses outside, as uh, Mr. Wagema says uh, rightfully. So you cannot just safeguard the wildlife inside the park and say they are safe. When they go out, that might be the sink or the place where they, they get lost or they get killed. So in the Savo area, Kenya Wildlife Service has uh, programs that it works with the, with the conservancies 
and private sector uh, outside. So there are detection dogs, for example, with big life that patrol the Amboseli area, going all the way to Savo. Uh, there, are, there are tracker dogs with the, the shared rates. We have AWF has uh, some dogs that, that, uh, that we support with Kenya Wildlife Service at Ingulia at the Rhino Sanctuary. Uh, also some dogs across the border in Tanzania, in, uh, in Mkomazi and in Toloha. So these teams work together. Uh, they, they basically like hand over the, the trafficker or the, the danger to each other. So they, they share the intelligence and that's where you have these arrests. Remember when they, you are watching the trafficker, the trafficker is also watching you as a law enforcement officer. And so you have, you have to be ahead of, of, of them. So you can't leave gaps in the landscape. Uh, if you leave the conservance is not well safeguarded or not part of the holistic uh, approach to, to law enforcement, you will be forming those gaps where the poachers can be hiding. Uh, it's a challenge, it's, never, it's work never done. And somebody asked that question. So if you allow me, I'll just say that this is one of the things I have learned through the years working with Kenya Life Service and others is that the, the problem of poaching and the benefits we get from conservation, if we want those conservation, the trafficking and poaching is a problem that will never end, just like any other law enforcement. You employ police, not just to arrest people, but to be a deterrent and be part of us. Because uh, poachers will always be there, traffickers will always be there, but we can keep the level of poaching down, down very low so that it doesn't affect the resource adversely. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kenya. Uh, you have anything to add to that? Um, I think he has, uh, Dr. Marudi has uh, quite spoke to it quite comprehensively. Uh, mm -hmm. We work together quite closely. At uh, some point, we even uh, go on track in conservancies. For example, if, if they're short on staff or short on uh, canine teams, and they do the same for us. And uh, we normally link up with uh, intelligence units as well. So... It's what you see here is is a is a mix is a hybrid of ideas and uh, exchange of information. So we work quite closely with our partners. Yeah, my friend from uh, Uganda, uh, NMG Nation uh, Media Group in Uganda, Zadok, uh, has a question to both of you. Yeah, have you in place canine breeding center so that you don't find yourself without dogs in future? Uh, Mr. Kenyo, I see you uh, responding to CRISPRs uh, on a question that I wanted to ask about, uh, oops, it's, you've answered it already. Uh, so I'll go to uh, Bernard Gitao uh, from MediaMax Network here in Kenya. Uh, Mr. Kenyo has said that at least nine Kenyans have died as a result of sets of flies. I would like to know if sets of flies have resorted to death of wild animals and how serious is the problem. Um, if you could take uh, both of these, Kenya. Uh, thank you for your question, uh, Bernard Gitao. Um, yes, we have lost uh, a number of dogs to 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 sesa flies, and uh, probably Dr. Muruthi would also speak to it. Uh, we haven't had uh, any deaths in wildlife, so they tend to be hosts of sesa flies. Uh, but the problem is, in fact, to humans, uh, they only give us sleeping sickness, which is uh, quite curable. But uh, for dogs, once, once uh, the dog is infected with trypanosomiasis, it's uh, an, almost a death sentence. So the dog will rot from inside out. Uh, we had even some dogs at some point go blind. Uh, And a, a, a threatening disease to us. So we work closely with uh, the small animal laboratory at the University of Nairobi. And uh, we have asked them to look into this. So we're hoping to get uh, lasting solutions very soon. You're on mute. You're on mute. Oh, sorry for that. Uh, Dr. Murudi, anything to add to that? Mark has answered quite well uh, about uh, trypanosomiasis. This is, uh, some of you will know the disease as Nagana in, our, in, uh, in, in uh, livestock. It's the 
is sleeping sickness. It causes uh, you know, enlarged lymph nodes uh, and in eventually loss of appetite, um, sickness, you know, anemia. Eventually, the, the animal the animal dies. Maybe something to mention here, as uh, Kinyo has mentioned, is uh, we are looking for solutions. We are quite interested in the in finding uh, insect repellents. Uh, we are working with people like ICIPE, the International Center for Insect Physiology and, uh, and Ecology, that can be used to repel. Uh, you can find a repellent that you can smear on the dog or the where it sleeps so that the, you keep off the sesse fly. Because during the day, the attacks don't occur mostly during the days when the dog is resting somewhere. Yeah, but uh, it's, a, it's a challenge. It's a challenge because some of the areas we work, like Savo, are, uh, are areas where you, you find sesse fly. Yeah, uh, why I like these kind of conversations is they lead to a bigger story or it's another story that we can pursue at, uh, at a later date, uh, like this one. Uh, uh, so, Dr. Murude, before you go, uh, there is a question from Good Hope Amani uh, from, Tanz uh, from Tanzania. I don't know if you're able to take this one. Uh, he's asking that a uh, uh, case of fights by dog teams in Tanzania seems to be low, very low compared to Uganda and Kenya. Is this because the dogs in Tanzania are very few or there is something else you know, going on? Um, I hope you could answer that. And from the both of you, you haven't answered the one, do we breed these dogs or where do we source uh, the canines? Yeah. <laughs> okay, let me start with the, with the one about fines. Because fines can be very, how you interpret fines is very interesting. It shows that you are working hard, but it, it might also show that you are a deterrent. So let's say, in the case of Kenya, let me use Kenya where we worked with Mark and others. And when we started in 20, 2015, Nairobi, Jomo Kenyatta was a notorious place. So the dogs once installed were finding, made so many fines and the number of fines went up. Uh, people were being taken to court. The news were going around among us, the, the trafficking community that, hey, be careful about Nairobi you might get caught. And you, usually you don't know how you've gotten caught because you, uh, it, your bag is checked at the, the air side once you have already checked it in. So you, you wonder, you know, how do they find out that I had something? It's the dog that has sniffed your bag once you've checked in, right? So the, 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 the fines increase, the deterrence occurs, they may shift or stop the behavior. Because what you want is behavior change. Uh, and especially stoppage. And therefore what you see is your teams are going every day, they are, they are checking, they are using intelligence, but they are not catching everybody. So you are seeing zero fines, but the effort is there. So if you want to look at the numbers, you'd say hey, Max team in Jemo Kenyatta is not working. So we track number of uh, visits, we track number of bugs checked, we track the effort so that we can combine that with the fines. And then we can decide whether it is a, a you know deter deterrence we are seeing. We also using intelligence are checking other areas. I saw a question about Busia. Yes, there are some dogs there. We are liaising with the with the we are, there is a, actually the way the dogs are placed in these countries uh, is that there it's very strategic. Each one of these countries we have talked about has a, a canine strategy, including where to place the dogs. And these are living documents which can be changed. Now on the question, uh, so that's what, that's what I would question about the, the, the fines. Initially, they would increase, then it becomes deterrent and you might, you have to track the effort so that you, you translate those two together. They are going out, they are policing, but they are not finding something. Therefore, they, it has been reduced. Now in Tanzania, that's exactly what, what happened. In Tanzania, we actually, the dog, we are supporting more dogs in Dar es Salaam, in, 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 uh, uh, in Kia, Kilimanjaro International, uh, we have some dogs in Komazi and in Serengeti, yet the number of fines in total seems smaller. The surveillance is very high. The fines are very high in Tanzania. And so it has remained low. And we, I want to congr congratulate the three countries of East Africa, because from where I see it as a, you know, a non-government, <laughs> an NGO, I have seen progress in this area. So in Tanzania, you remember there is a time when the poaching was very high. They have accurately recovered that and their elephant population is going up again. 
So that's, you know, Ongera Kwao. So that's what is happening in Tanzania. High, very, very high surveillance, uh, but also very high fines. Eh? If you are caught in Tanzania, it's not, a, it's not an easy life. Uh, but also very high education uh, you know, as we do with wildlife clubs and others. The players in this field, the dogs are part of a larger, I want to communicate that the dogs are very important, but they are also part of a larger scheme. Uh, agencies working together led by the uh, point agency in the, the authority for wildlife. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, uh, for that, you know, uh, in-depth answer. Uh, so the challenge you have from your answer to the to the authorities and to NGOs like yourself who support the authorities is consistency, you know, uh, to keep doing it uh, and to get more funds to keep doing this great work uh, because we might, you know, rest on our laurels saying that uh, uh, we're not having fines so that we, uh, we, 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 are, we, we can go home and take a nap, yeah. Uh, so there is a very good question here uh, from Joyce. Uh, Chibi, that she's asking, do you have community-led canine conservation units or any units where local communities are taking a notable collaborative effort to both speakers? And I've been told the question on breeding of dogs has not been answered. Sorry, yeah. let me answer that first. Let me answer that <laughs> first, uh, Kieran, then, and then Mark will come in. Um, yeah. Okay, so I said, during my, 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 my talk, I said every dog can sniff, even my little dog outside here. But uh, not every dog is as good as detect, at detection and being trained as a tracker dog. So we, to reduce uh, attrition, uh, so which I, by which I mean, if you start with 10 dogs, sometimes you may only end up maybe with two if, you, if they are not bred for that, uh, for that uh, work. So what we do, we, we, we reduce that um, front, attrition by going to breeders who already are breeding dogs to be for this kind of work. Uh, in Netherlands, here in Kenya, there are a few breeders, but uh, we, have, we have a trained trainer who is based, Will, uh, Will Powell, who is in, uh, in, works in Tanzania, and we buy our dogs from, uh, from the Netherlands, which we have zero attrition. All puppies that are, he, he buys and trains, end up being good working dogs. So that's, that's what we do. We have tried before taking dogs from a breeder here in Kenya and uh, you know, about half did not end up being good uh, uh, detection dogs. So that, they, they, that's, that would be my answer. So there are people who are breeding dogs for specifically for this. Um, are there dogs on conservances? Yes. Uh, and it's a partnership. So for example, in, um, in the Amboseli area, Big Life, which is an NGO, has dogs, it works on with the communities in the Imbirikani uh, area, and also in the Amboseli area working with Kenya Wildlife Service. Uh, in the north, there are some dogs, also some ranch, some of those ranches have got dogs, and then you know they work with the communities. Uh, this has to be, it's just because it's a very specialized field, it's not something, you know, you can't just buy, you know, your usual community, a few tracker dogs and say, go work. Even the rangers and the handlers have to be retrained constantly. And that's the role of Mark and the technical advisors that we, we attach to, to this. Remember the dogs are facing like the disease issues, they get tired, they, they eat. <laughs> Somebody put a question in there that these dogs seem to be very expensive and being taken care of so, you know, so, so nicely, yes. If you look at the resource they are safeguarding and the value it has, you need to, they are not expensive, they just need greater due diligence. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I would let you go on that question. Uh, oh, you've mentioned rangers, and there was another question. I know you've answered uh, live, but uh, for everyone, they were asking, yes, the, the dogs are trained, uh, they never miss nothing, uh, they detect, uh, but they are manned uh, by people, as you have seen from the images uh, from Mr. Kenyon. How about if these people are compromised? That, that was the question. Uh. Yes, <laughs> let me attempt to then uh, Kenya will come in. Um, corruption is with us. Eh? So what happens is to, to get this, uh, to get to, to be a dog handler, 
are highly elevated. I'll give you an example. We were going for, when we went to Uganda, we wanted to have four dogs, four specialized dogs in Entebbe. And uh, that usually the ratio is about two to one. So eight handlers for four dogs. Uh, the eight, the 10 that were recruited, because you need two spare ones just in case somebody is going on leave, were recruited from 70, a pool of 75. And uh, the recruitment is, some people give up early during the recruitment until you can zero in to, and then with the, during the training, there are special modules that are dealing with corruption. We have had cases where our, so where the, in Kenya Allied Service, I'm aware of people, who, uh, handlers that were approached with a lot of money and they said, no, these are people who are dedicated. I'm not saying corruption cannot happen, but just like in a specialized you know, force, you, you, your officers are dedicated fast, and then they are, they are well-trained, they are well-remunerated, and you know, they, 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 then, they then do their job. Thank you for that, Dr. Murudi. Can you, uh, your take on those questions, uh, especially uh, the breeding, and then I'll come again to you to answer another question from Bernard. Um, now, uh, breeding is a tricky science. It's um, you have to choose the right dogs, have the right pedigree. So, by pedigree, I mean uh, you know know the lineage, know the parents of that dog, know the grandparents of that dog, the great grandparents. Sometimes you go to up to four to five generations back, and uh, you have to make sure that they are free of diseases, uh, they are free of uh, inherent. Uh, genetic disabilities. So we normally try and uh, avoid that. So we go to specific breeders, just like uh, Dr. Murudi said, and uh, we found some very good dogs in the Netherlands through African Wildlife Foundation uh, that do quite a good job. Um, so when we are recruiting our rangers, we normally pick them from the pool of uh, serving rangers. And uh, of course, the Ranger Kada to commanding uh, NCOs, uh, non commissioned officers, and uh, we'll check their track record because these are people who have served for some uh, five to 10 years. And that, that's the same thing that happens in Europe. So, for you to meet the cutting edge to come into the dog unit, you have to have an outstanding performance and uh, very clean record so we have been approached by some uh, uh, you know crooked characters trying to uh, compromise us but uh, so far so good we have been able to stand our ground uh, because just like uh, philip said uh, the resource that we are safeguarding is quite massive and it's a global resource it's not even a national resource it's an international resource Thank you uh, so much, uh, Mr. Kenya. It's very interesting uh, to hear the legs you go to uh, to recruit uh, the canines as well as the human, you know, rangers. I wish we could uh, be able to vet uh, the people we employ, or uh, like the rangers are uh, going back to their ancestry. You know, that's you know uh, quite an amazing answer. Uh, so there is another question for you uh, from. Uh, uh, referring to one of the slides, where you say that uh, 500 kilograms of scales of pangolin, I would like to know the street value uh, for such, so as we know the kind of data and the kind of problem we are talking about here. Yeah. Um, wow. I um, I don't know. I do not want to lie because we don't have the figures here. Uh, Philip maybe can come in and help, but... Uh, I'm not sure whether we are clear on the street value of pangolin skills uh, abroad. And maybe Dr. Murudi, as you take that, you can tell us why is the pangolin uh, heavily you know, poached today? Or is it the heavily you know, poached mammal? Um, could there be the reason behind this? Yeah. Maybe I can speak yes. to that. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, Mark. Sorry, Dr. Tari. Uh, so, you know, we have very weird uh, beliefs and uh, our Asian friends sometimes believe that the pangolin skills uh, cure cancer. 
and uh, also increase milk for lactating mothers. And uh, you can imagine what would happen. Uh, what happens then when you believe uh, you believe that uh, it can cure the, one of the biggest diseases uh, globally right now, which is cancer. So uh, that's why pangolins are heavily poached, uh, heavily trafficked. Uh, Dr. Marubi? It's really an interesting question and a, a very important question. And I, I'm glad that it has been asked. And Mark's answer to why the poaching? Why are people consuming these products? They are leading to extinction and local extinctions of species like the rhino that I talked about, you know, the northern uh, black rhino, longipeds that were used to live in Cameroon. Uh, and why is all this? Because people have created a myth, needs around the utility of this uh, product. So for example, rhino horn is supposed to be Viagra. Uh, it's a, you know, you can sniff a uh, rhino horn and get a high. Uh, you can put it in your wine. Uh, ivory was a status symbol for a long time. And Yemen in the, in the 70s and 80s, Yemen was one of the greatest consumers. And you can imagine the symbol was that you, you, you carried a dagger whose handle was made of, of ivory. And whenever somebody saw that, you know, your status was high. So this, some of these myths of medicinal value, um, can we rule this out completely? No, we have to educate people. And that's why we had the Stop the Demand campaign, like in China, because a lot of the people that we've spoken to in places like China and Vietnam do sincerely believe that those things work, but they don't. There is no, science has proven that there is none uh, in terms of medicinal value. So pangolins are uh, hunted for their meat, and again, if you are a trafficker, the myth that you want to create is the specialty of that product that you are trying to sell illegally. So some people believe that it is special. It will, uh, Mark has said, it will uh, stimulate milk production. There is no data to show that. So there is a, you know, we are causing people to die who would have gone to hospital because they are consuming this medicine that doesn't work, that is not medicine. Uh, the values, that question is a, is a difficult one to answer because you, it's already an illegal product. So what, you, what, you, what we do with the with organization such as Traffic, WWF and IFO is to study the value of that pro in, in the consumer countries. So pangolin scale is about $600 a kilo. Um, there is a time when rhino horn was very expensive. So we are dealing with a product whose value has been really, really, uh, because of the myths and the reality of the product, rhino horn per kilo was costing $60,000. The prices have gone down uh, slightly, and the price of ivory, I believe, was, uh, don't quote me, but the primary uh, was about uh, $3,000, 2000 to $3,000 a kilo of ivory. And each, if each task is more than five kilos, you can see what you're talking about. So it's high value uh, uh, products. But because there is no legal trade in these products. Everything you are talking about is, is, is this, well, <laughs> the value on the street, the illegal, the, it's an illegal product. And so that fluctuates a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Murodi, as well as Mr. Kenua, uh, Didi Wamukoya, uh, who I believe works with AFW as well, we hosted how uh, in other webinars, uh, says it costs to about six hundred uh, dollars uh, per kilo per kg. Uh, that's the pangolin scale. That would be about seventy-four thousand Kenya shillings, one point four million uh, in Tanzania. I was trying to find UGX. That's Uganda, uh, about uh, two point one million. Uh, so I think it's an important question uh, to us. Uh, to ask uh, so that we can compare that uh, as a data journalist uh, with the effort you know that is making uh, to deter is made to deter you know uh, these kind of uh, crimes. Uh, I, I think uh, the, you, you want to make a something? comment. Yes, I yes. want to add that, that these prices are yeah. prices in the consumer country. So the person who so the chain starts from say. 
let's we just pick Masai Mara a bit arbitrarily, that person is not getting the $600. The poacher is getting very little. Then they, what they do, they will then take their product and maybe it is containerized in Nairobi and shipped to say Beijing or, you know, or Cambodia. Those prices are in Cambodia. So the actual value in Mara is very, very minimal. So we, we are better placed uh, to conserve our wildlife and we earn from the intrinsic, intrinsic value and from tourism uh, and the likes. Uh, Edward, uh, who is my colleague here, was asking the destination uh, countries. I, I think you have alluded to mostly Asia. Um, I will go into that. Uh, I know Dr. Murude, you wanted to take a hard stop at the Viridachi because we you have another um, meeting and I think we'll add at exactly 330. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us. I'll give you uh, both of you uh, one, one minute uh, to do closing remarks. Uh, but before that, I'd like to thank our participants uh, from the Father State, as well from partners in the conservation world. Um, I guess I'm I, I want to ask Rose, uh, my colleague, uh, to share our, uh, you can send me the link, uh, Rose, and then I'll share to the whole team. Uh, as I had said, we, we have a survey. Uh, kindly, we'd love for you uh, to fill it. Uh, uh, let us know uh, your thoughts. Uh, let me put it uh, on the link right now. On the chat, uh, kindly, Take a moment uh, to fill it up. Uh, your thoughts, your feedback is very important uh, to us. Mm. What's happening to our chat? I'll put it on the Q&A uh, kindly, and then we'll share it uh, with uh, Uh, sorry, people, we seem to have a problem with our chat and our Q&A. Uh, not able to minute uh, to share these. Okay, there's the link. Uh, kindly uh, take a moment. You can download it on your phone, on your desktop, and answer it at your time. We'll also share that uh, with this recording as well as the presentations. Uh, are we allowed to share your presentations, uh, Dr. Murudi, as well as uh, Mr. Kenya? Yes, you can share mine. Yeah. Yes, as yeah. well as your contacts. And I know probably mostly our colleagues uh, from the media uh, will be able to ask you a question uh, to follow up uh, with this you know, very great and interesting conversation that we have had. We've learned uh, a lot. Uh, it's not always uh, we, we hear uh, from the government as well from the NGO uh, on specific uh, issues uh, because as a media organization, support organization, are we trying to promote uh, the journalism of solutions not the journalism of pro problems. Uh, look at the problems and the responses that the various actors are coming upon with. And we believe this is just a part uh, of uh, that solution into curbing the illegal wildlife trade. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, kindly refer to otherjournalism.net and we'll also send you an email uh, who, uh, for, for the, all the attendants. Uh, Dr. Murudi, uh, your closing remarks, one minute, and then we'll go to Mr. Kenya and we we'll edit at Grivati. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you very much uh, to you and uh, for inviting us and uh, for this opportunity to speak about our work. Um, in, and just to say that uh, you know, wildlife and natural resources are our heritage. They are also, if you would like, you know, they are citizens of Africa, they have the right and we can treat them well, we'll be treating ourselves well uh, for our own human uh, well-being and economic development. Uh, we need this, and I want to close with uh, you know an appeal and uh, for journalists like you to really promote this cause, promote the cause which is important for not only our generation but the generations to come. But you know, thank you very much. We can deal with this a problem that can be dealt with as we have uh, demonstrated since we started working on it, and uh, while well, we deal with the uh, trafficking and poaching 
and uh, with that, combined with other activities, we will create the opportunity for our people and ourselves to benefit from wildlife. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kenyo. Um, thank you, Mr. Kiundu and uh, all the participants uh, of this webinar. Uh, we'd like, especially like to thank the members of the fourth estate and you are very key in spreading the message. And uh, I think we demonstrated that uh, canines do work and uh, we'll continue to use them in the long term. Uh, and these are actually proper working dogs. These are, these are not just uh, what people here in our country call chihuahuas. Uh, these are proper and uh, properly trained working dogs. So let's uh, support this course, just like uh, Dr. Maruti said. Uh, spread the message far and wide, and uh, let's continue interacting. Uh, so thank you for your participation. Thank you so much again, our esteemed speakers and everyone else uh, for joining, for our colleagues in the media, chihuahuas or not, let's activate our nose for news and use it to tell the stories of our wildlife and of the efforts of all the conservationists uh, in our uh, iconic landscapes. May God bless you. Have a, uh, a nice time. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.